All right, hello and welcome everyone. In this video, I'm gonna do a walkthrough of the solution to our first exam. So question one, the assumption that preferences are complete requires that the consumer is able to rank any two baskets, right? That's our definition of completeness. Preferences are complete if you're able to make a comparison between any possible baskets or bundles of goods. You'd violate completeness if you just kind of throw up your hands and say, when asked to compare two bundles, I don't know, and I don't know how to compare these. Well, that would violate completeness. So completeness is the property of being able to rank any or rank any two baskets, compare any two baskets, say that you like one better than the other, or you're indifferent between them. Option B says C is preferred to A if B is preferred to A and C is preferred to B. I don't know. That hurts my head. Um, to rank a basket with more units of all goods higher than a basket with fewer of all goods, well, this would be kind of like more is better. Completeness doesn't require that we rank the bundles in a particular way, just that we can make a comparison. Uh, to have diminishing marginal rate of substitution, it's a completely different concept. Uh, okay, so an indifference curve represents, well, it's not varying levels of total utility, right? The indifference curve is gonna represent an indifference curve. One indifference curve is gonna represent constant level of utility. It's not constant marginal utility, right? Because you could have Cobb-Douglas, which has the MRS for Cobb-Douglas, remember, would be like alpha over beta times y over x. And so for a given point, for a given bundle, x, y, you'd have a different MRS, right? So it had diminishing marginal rate of substitution. That's not constant. Definitely not the slope of marginal utility, right? So, um, well, I said that's MRS. That's actually the slope of marginal utility. That's a derivative of a derivative. So that's actually something completely, that's actually not this. Slope of marginal utility, um, that's weird. That also that also hurts my head. So it's not margin. It's not MRS. It's also not a useful concept. An indifference curve is going to represent yeah a two dimensional slice of a three dimensional total utility function, right? Our total utility function, we said in class was like in three dimensions, right? Utility over x and y is a multivariable function. And matter of fact, like the representation of the indifference curves that we saw, that's not that's like not the function, right? If you think of like the perfect substitutes utility function, two x plus like two y, for instance, try to draw the graph of that thing, or drop that into like some type of solver or MATLAB or whatever, it's going to give you a plane, right? It's not it's not the indifference curves. Think about it for a second. Think of like the perfect subs utility function just as like an example. All right, now think of how we've represented them. Well, we've represented them with like a line y equals mx plus b, right? Just like a straight line. That's a kind of a different function. So, all right, so the indifference curve represents a two-dimensional slice of a three-dimensional three total utility function. Number three, suppose all prices double and income triples. What happens to the budget line? Well, the budget line is going to shift out from the origin, right? So suppose we started here. We doubled all prices, or as you double the price, you could buy half as much. So I'm going to shift in. All right, well, I would rotate in and then rotate in the other one. So think of what's happening to the, think about the intercept. It's M over price. So M over two price is going to be less uh, total amount of whatever is a horizontal good and less of the whatever is the vertical good. But then tripling the income is going to shift us back out. So now you're going to have what, what's going to, what, what would be the, what would be the equation for the intercept? Well, originally the intercept is going to be M over P1 and then M over P2. Now you'd end up having what? 3M over 2P, right? 3M over 2P or like 1.5, uh, 1.5 um, times M over P. Okay, so it's going to definitely shift out from the origin. Question number four. Suppose marginal utility of X is 10, marginal utility of Y is 1. What's our interpretation? Well, here we have a consumer who's willing to substitute 10 units of Y for one unit of X, leaving utility unchanged, right? MUX over MUY is gonna be 10 over one. Think for example, right, our perfect subs utility function, right? Marginal utility of X, that's the coefficient on X and perfect subs. Marginal utility of Y, that's the coefficient on the, on the Y with perfect subs. And this would give rise to these downward sloping and difference curves that have a slope of 10, right? So you're willing to give up 10 Y for one X, right? Now this wouldn't necessarily have to be, there's other, there's other utility functions that could have M U X equal 10 M U X equals one, but like, well, at a particular point, but like one good one to kind of get us the intuition would be perfect subs. Okay. Uh, and then this was nonsense. Regardless of prices, consumer would choose only X. Let's see. Well, to be able to say that we'd only want X, we would need a situation where the marginal rate of substitution was steeper than the price ratio, or 
if we were going to consume only Y, we need a situation where the price ratio was steeper than the MRS, the indifference curves. In order for that to happen, we would have to know something about prices. We're simply not given that information. Question number five, if X is an inferior good and the price of X falls, the substitution effect induces the consumer to purchase more X. The income effect induces the consumer to, pur to purchase less X. What's going on? Well, okay, so the, we have an inferior good. The price of X falls. As the price of X falls, it's now becoming relatively cheaper. So you're going to substitute towards the now relatively cheaper good. At the same time, because the good is relatively cheaper, my money is going farther. I can buy more of actually all goods. All right, so this is like an increase in wealth and becoming wealthier. But what happens when your income rises? You buy less of the inferior good, right? So the substitution effect is going to have me buy more X. The income effect is going to have me buy less X because the good is an inferior good. All right. Question six, suppose the consumer has a utility function with marginal utility of X is 5Y squared times X and marginal utility of Y is 2X squared times Y. What's the MRS? Well, marginal utility of X divided by marginal utility of Y is the MRS, right? So 5Y over 2X. Consider the utility function. This is perfect complement, it's complements. So utility is given by the minimum of 5x and 7y. Assuming the consumer is already currently optimizing and their income rises, what do they have to do to increase their satisfaction? Well, they're gonna need more of both because if you're already currently optimizing and you just get more of one or the other, that's gonna be wasteful. You actually need more of both x and y to move to a higher indifference curve, right? So what would have happened? Well, the budget constraint would have shifted out here, and now you'd be able to go on to like, another indifference curve that I hadn't drawn. All right, so which of the following statements is true about the consumer's expenditure minimization problem? Well, it's true by definition, part or A is. Consumer's expenditure minimization problem results in the same optimal basket as the consumer's utility maximization problem. If the same or if the required level of utility for the expenditure minimi minimizer is the same as the maximized utility for the utility maximizer, that's true, true by definition, right? So the expenditure minimization problem gives us the same basket if we're trying to hit the same level of utility uh, that was um, maximized by our utility maximizer. That's matter of fact, that's actually like how we built up the example and how I introduced expenditure minimization in class. Uh, all right, so the consumer's expenditure minimization has an optimum at an expenditure of zero. <laughs> That's just silly. All right, consumer's utility maximization problem results in a tangency between the budget constraint and the indifference curve, whereas the expenditure minimization problem results in a solution where the indifference curve crosses the budget line. Well, I mean, the type of solution is a property of the utility function itself, not a function of the, not a property of the type of problem, right? So I say that's a property of the utility function. If we're gonna get a situation where the indifference curve crosses the budget line, you're thinking of something with like perfect subs or um, uh, perfect subs utility. If you're getting something with a tangency, you're thinking of something like Cobb-Douglas, right? So those are properties of the utility function. Consumer always prefers to maximize utility rather than to minimize expenditure. I mean, it's equivalent given the assumptions. Like with the right assumptions, it's just two ways of looking at the same problem. So, all right, Jack likes homemade orange juice and discovered the optimal proportion of oranges and cups of sugar. Jack's utility function is therefore Utility is whatever is a smaller of 2x1 and x2. The prices of the two goods are P1 is 8, P2, P2 is 3, respectively. Jack's minimum expenditure for attaining the 140 units of utility. Right. So to hit a utility of 140, we're going to need, what, 2x. Let's replace the comma with an equals. So 140 is equal to 2x1 equals 2x2, or sorry, is equal to x2. So the first one gives us 2x1 is equal to 140, or we need 70 units of good one. We'll need 140 units of good two. And then utility would be the minimum of 2 times 70, which is 140, and 140, which is going to equal the 140 we're after. And sure enough, then the expenditure, here's just the budget constraint, is going to be the 980. Okay. All right, and so the consumer's expenditure minimization problem, remember, looks a lot like the firm's cost minimization problem. All right, if a consumer states they're indifferent between receiving a cash gift certificate for $10 at the local bookstore and receiving $10 cash, we can infer if given cash, what's this consumer gonna do? Well, if they're saying that they're indifferent, and we know cash is always better because cash is fungible, you can put cash in whichever consumption pattern you would like, right? You have more options with cash, like see the example from IMX1. So that's like the first video from the, um, from the IMX uh, re uh, review problems. 
So this is going back to uh, Deidre McCluskey's uh, budget constraint example with the voucher for uh, for housing, right? Anyway, so the idea is like cash is better because you have more options available. However, if the consumer is telling us that they're indifferent, well, then this would must be the case that they're planning already to be spending at least the $10 at the bookstore, right? Otherwise, they wouldn't be indifferent. Otherwise, they'd prefer the cash. Suppose for a utility function, suppose for a utility function that the marginal utility for good x is given by mux is equal to 5y squared over x. So what do we know? Well, it could say, well, the answer is the more is better assumption is satisfied for x in this utility function. How do we know? Well, utility is increasing in x. So for higher and higher levels of x, the marginal utility is going to be positive. So utility is going to be rising as x is rising. So more is better is definitely satisfied. Uh, so that rules out A. Uh, let's see, this shows a positive and increasing marginal utility of x. Positive and increasing marginal utility of x. Well, let's see. Marginal utility is decreasing in, in x. So you take the second derivative, and then this would be sine negative. So marginal utility is positive but decreasing. So marginal utility is uh, not positive and in increasing. It's positive and decreasing in x. Uh, let's see, the marginal rate of substitution must be diminishing? No, it could actually be constant. So, so we have mux right here. Suppose muy was the same function, right? Then the, mar the marginal rate of substitution would just be one, right? If muy was this and mux is this, then mu MRS would be one, which would be constant, not diminishing. All right, so 12, economists sometimes represent two goods as having right angled indifference curves, perfect complements. In reality, this violates more is better, right? This is like my, this is like my ultra marathon example where I put my shoes in the wrong drop bags. I had one in one drop bag, one in the other. So I wanted to switch shoes. So when I got to the aid station, I had a basket that had one single shoe in it. So now I had two right shoes and one left shoe, which doesn't help me when the other shoe is in the other drop bag 10 miles ahead. Right, that violates more is better. I was not better off. I was actually substantially worse off, actually. And then, um, anyway, so that's a different story. All right, so question 13. An agent consumes goods X and Y with prices PX is five, PY is eight. Consumer's income is 48. The government imposes a tax of a dollar per unit on good X. What's the new equation? Well, let's just think of this as an increase in the price of good X. So rather than five, it's gonna be five plus one. So the price, let's just treat like the price paid by the buyers as uh, six, right? And then just solving, this is y is equal to six minus six eighths or you know, three fourths x, that's this one b. All right, 14, suppose that utility function is given by minimum of three x and y. Further suppose price of good x is five per unit, price of good y is 10 per unit, income is 105. For this consumer, what's the optimal basket? There's a couple different ways to do this. You can do the way that I hope you did it, which is replace this comma with an equal sign, get three X is equal to Y, substitute into the budget constraint, five X plus 10 Y is equal to 105, five X plus 10 times three X is 105, and then solving, okay, 35 X is equal to 105, 105 divided by 35 is three, so then Y has to be nine, because three times three is nine, and that's how I'd like you to solve the problem. There's another way to solve it, right? So you can look at these and you could drop these into the into the utility function and determine which ones have to be ruled out. So you'd rule out this one and you'd rule out this one. You rule you'd rule out A and B immediately and then you'd see C you'd see that C doesn't satisfy the budget constraint. C is uh, feasible but inefficient and then you'd have to be D. So that'd be the other way to solve the problem. Um, and that's actually only just a function of the fact that I wrote it as a multiple choice question. So anyway, uh, when given a choice between cash, which can be spent on either good or a voucher that can be worth the same dollar amount or that can only be applied to the purchase of one single good, what is the consumer going to prefer? The consumer always prefers cash to the voucher or would be indifferent between the two. When are they indifferent between the two? Well, see the example that you just answered before about the bookstore. Like that's the situation where you'd be indifferent between the two. Um, and so, yeah, would prefer not to receive neither the cash nor the voucher. No, that's silly, right? Consumer would always prefer the voucher to the cash why right i don't know maybe just like vouchers whatever so you know the consumer is always going to prefer cash we always just want cash uh given goods if they ever exist are most likely to occur when the good in question is it's a staple remember the story for a given good this is a strongly inferior good right the given good story was the price of the good rises so you buy more of it well, that's weird why well it's something that you're spending a lot of money on when the price rises you are now relatively poorer what do you do when you're relatively poor? You buy more of the inferior good. 
So you buy more of the Giffen good, right? It's got to be strongly in theory because this income effect has to swamp out the substitution effect because as the price of the good rises, substitution effect wants us to buy less of it. So the income effect has to overcome that and have us buy more. All right. Uh, suppose marginal utility of X is 10, marginal utility of Y is 20. Further, suppose this consumer's budget constraint can be expressed by 20X plus 10Y. These are not the same things. This is the price of good X, this is the price of good Y, this is 400. These go into what? Perfect substitutes utility function. Uh, anyway, so for this for this consumer, the optimal amount of good X to buy would be, all right, the MRS is going to be one half. The price ratio is going to be two. Price ratio, budget constraint steeper than the indifference curves, or the indifference curves are flatter than the budget constraint. That's our alley solution, our econ front alley, right? Well, if it's going to be alley, how much are we going to buy of X? None. All right. Question 18, true or false? The same ordering of bundles is represented by the following two utility functions? Yeah, this is a monotone transformation of the other. The natural log is a monotone transformation. That was from the slide. Also, this is like our, one of the most useful places to take the, the monotone transformation. The other way to justify that we have the same orderings of bundles. So one thing you could do is you could just demonstrate the monotone transformation. The other thing you could do is you could show the MRSs are the same. That's actually what I wanted you to do, is you'd say, okay, let's take MU, let's take the partial with respect to good X, take the partial with respect to good Y, that's MUX, MUY solving. This is our Cobb Douglas MRS, alpha over one over one, alpha over one minus alpha times Y over X. Wait, there's an easier way to do it. You could take the partial with respect to the natural logged version, right? Derivative of the natural log is one over X, so alpha times one over X. Derivative of this natural log is one over Y, so alpha, so one minus alpha over Y. All right, that's this and this. This divided by that, it's a lot easier to do than this divided by all that stuff, right? Either way, it comes out the same. You're gonna get the same MRS, right? So the plug in a given bundle, you're gonna get a different utility level here and here. However, the rate of trade-off between them at a given bundle is gonna be the same because you get the same MRS. All right, Dave. Dave currently consumes 10 hot dogs and six sodas each week. That seems unusual. It's way more hot dogs and sodas than I would consume in a year, but whatever. So Dave's current consumption bundle, uh, or at the Dave's current consumption bundle, marginal utility for Dave's for hot dogs for Dave is five. Dave's marginal utility for soda is three. The price of one hot dog is a dollar. Price of one soda is 50 cents. True or false, Dave's currently maximizing utility. If false, which direction should Dave change Dave's spending in order to increase utility? Well, it's false. So you're going to compare the marginal utility of hot dogs to the margin to the price of hot dogs versus the marginal utility of soda to price of soda. Turns out this is going to be comparison of five to six. Six is bigger than five, which tells us we're going to increase our consumption in the direction of soda, right? Um, and so we have MU, we have the marginal utilities at this current bundle. These are not necessarily subs, could be. We, it's actually useful to borrow perfect subs logic here, although this bang for your buck principle holds for, you know, for all of our utility functions. And though it's useful to borrow substitutes uh, intuition here, this isn't necessarily, it's not necessarily a perfect subs question. For Max, the secret to a great morning is always to mix one glass of milk with five crushed graham crackers and then throw it on the floor. That wasn't part of the problem, but it's real. So here's Max's utility function, right? It's going to be whatever is the smaller of 5x1 and x. Okay. Here's how you can check. So here was one glass of milk. Here's five graham crackers. Sure enough, there's no waste. Utility is going to be five, right? My utility is going to be negative five. Uh, assuming the price of good one is one, price of good two is one and income is 90, find Max's optimal bundle. So, all right, let's replace this comma with an equal sign and then drop this into the budget constraint. X1 plus X2 is 90. X1 plus five X1 is 90. Six X1 is 90 or X1 is 15. But then if X1 is 15, X2 is 75. So that's Max's optimal bundle. Find the indirect utility function or indirect utility at the optimal bundle, well, let's drop this bundle into the utility function, right? So the indirect utility, it's a value function. It's evaluating your utility function at the optimal. So sure enough, indirect utility level is gonna be 75. If you actually solved correctly for the full functional form of the indirect utility, okay. Um, really, we just needed the indirect utility, so just the utility uh, level at that bundle. Consider a consumer with utility given by the following utility function, x1 to the 1 half uh, plus x2. Suppose the consumer currently faces prices 1 and 2 for 
good one and two respectively with income M. Find the consumer's MRS and their optimal bundle if they have six units of income available. All right, well, the marginal utility of good one is gonna be one half X1 to the minus one half, right? That's just this partial derivative. So one half comes up front, reduce the power by one, good. And then the derivative here is just gonna be the coefficient, which is one. This divided by this is the MRS, that's just one half X1 to the minus one half. This one half was our price ratio. So the optimal amount of good one is one. And this is the amount that the consumer is gonna be super fixated on. They're gonna really wanna make sure they're focused on making sure that they're able to get one unit of good, uh, of good one. All right, we can drop this into the budget constraint and find out how much of good two they're gonna want. It's gonna be five halves. Continue to assume the consumer has six units of income. What is gonna be the consumer's optimal choice bundle if the price of good one falls to one half? All right, well, so this changes the price ratio. Marginal rate of substitution is still the same. Price ratio is now gonna be one half divided by two, which is one fourth. Solving now, the optimal amount of good one is four. How much good two does the consumer buy? Well, two units of good two. We drop this four into the budget constraint. Now the consumer can only afford two units of good two. Part C, find the consumer's Marshallian demands for good one and good two, given these prices and this income, right? Marshallian demands are just what we've been working with. That's the demands we get from solving the consumer's utility maximization problem. That's gonna give us demand for good one and good two as a function of price of good one and price of good two and income. All right, well, we've actually kind of got a lot of the intuition we need already. So the demand for good one, that's just gonna be one, right? Remember, they're very focused on good one, right? Or one unit of good one. When are they gonna be able to get that one unit? Well, if their income is at least one. Why? Because the price of good one is one. So they have to have at least one unit of income to be able to buy a full unit. If not, they're just going to buy as much as they can afford, right? Why? Because the price of good one continues to still be one. And so my demand is going to be, actually, I should write this maybe M over one, but that's kind of silly. So uh, the demand for good one is going to be M. If income is less than one, it's going to be one. If income is greater than or equal to one. What about the demand for good two? Well, to find this, let's drop this into our budget constraint. And then solving, we find, oh, the consumer wants M minus one divided by two units of good two, but they'll only do that if they have more than enough to buy that one unit of X, of X one, of good one. If not, how much good two do they buy? None, because they're if they cannot buy the one unit of good one that they want, they're just gonna keep buying uh, as much of it as they can. And so I didn't show this here, you could, you could compare the MRS to the price ratio when M is less than one and it'll see that this will tip us in the direction of putting any money that you have into good one. I did that on one, like one of the IMAXs, and uh, I think I had another example that did something like that. Although that was unnecessary to solve that question. All right, consider a consumer with the following preferences. These are perfect subs. One half X1 plus X2 facing prices three and five for goods one and two respectively with income 15. Find the consumer's optimal bundle. Well, the MRS, gonna be one half, right? The partial here is one half, partial here is one, so one half divided by one is one, versus the price ratio, three fifths, so this is 0.5 versus 0.6, right? How do I know this is 0.6? Let's scale this up to be out of 10, so multiply by two, so this would be six, this would be 10, so six tenths is the same as three fifths. Six tenths, you recognize as 0.6, I don't know, so that was fun, I don't know why I just said that. I don't know, hopefully, hopefully that benefited somebody. Anyway, so this is our all Y solution because the slope of the budget constraint is going to be steeper than the slope of the indifference curves. That's this picture. So our all Y solution, how much Y can we afford? Well, it's going to be 15 divided by five or three units of good two. How much good one do we buy? None, because that's on the intercept. Suppose the consumer receives three units of good one for free. Draw the new graph that represents the consumer's budget constraint after getting those three units of good one for free and find their optimal bundle. Well, what we need to do is we need to draw the new budget constraint rightward shifted. Consumer is going to get three units of good one for free, right? So that's going to move out, not how much good two we can buy, but it's going to move out how much good one we're starting with, right? And so the optimal bundle is actually still going to be up here. It's still going to be all Y, but it's not really all Y because you're getting those, you're retaining those free good one. Right? So the optimal bundle is going to be right here, though you're spending all your money on Y, but you're keeping, you know, you got whatever was the three units you got for free. So that's the solution there. I think that's actually kind of a really cool problem. 
So continue to assume the consumer still receives three units of good one for free. Find their expenditure minimization, solve the expenditure minimization problem to discover the cheapest way to attain utility of 4.5. Well, all right, so let's set the utility equal to our perfect subs utility function, right? And then given that we've got three units of good one, that's gonna start us off with a 1.5 here. Here's a 4.5 solving. We need three units of good two. Those three units that we're actually buying is gonna cost us $15. We didn't have to buy these three units of good one. We got that for free. You might have thought, well, what if we needed all X? Well, good, but to get 4.5 units of utility with all X, we're gonna need one third times three plus X1. I've written that this way, so we see how many units of X1 we're actually gonna to need to buy beyond the three we got for free. All right, so let's move this one half, you know, multiply through by two, I guess. So we get nine is equal to three plus X1 or six X1 is how much X1 we actually need to buy. Well, if we have to buy six more units of X1 and each X1 costs $3 or three, right? That's gonna be a price of 18 or expenditure of 18, which is not the cheapest way to attain that level of utility. All right, Let's cons uh, consider a consumer with preferences given by the following Cobb Douglas utility function. So square root of good one, or the square root of X1 times the square root of X2. With this budget constraint, write down the consumer's utility maximization problem using the Lagrangian. Find the first order conditions that you ultimately solve. Okay, so Lagrangian is going to give us the objective function minus the constraint. Then we're going to take the partial derivative with respect to good one. This is mux or mu1, right? So this is going to be one half x1 reduce this by reduce the power by one. This x2 to the one half comes along for the ride. The partial here is just going to be, well, this is the coefficient on that, on that one, on that good one, or x1. All right, and over here, this works the same. Now we're going to take this power out front, reduce this by one. This x1 to the one half comes along for the ride, minus lambda p2. And then the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to lambda, it's just the constraint. Now solving this, I mean, you could draw the ratio bar right there, and you can see this is mu one, this is mu2, this is p1 over p2, so this is mrs equals price ratio, or you could actually do the algebra. Either way, you're gonna come out with x2 over x1 equals uh, p, p1 over p2, or p1 x1 is equal to p2 x2, the expenditure on good one is equal to the expenditure on good two. Dropping this into the budget constraint, you'll have the expenditure on good one plus the expenditure on good one because I substituted. And then solving, I'll find my Marshallian demand for good one is m over 2p1. My Marshallian demand for good two is m over 2p2. Finding my indirect utility function, oh, I'm gonna drop this in, right? So the indirect utility is evaluating your utility function at the optimal. So u of x1 star, x2 star, that's just this. Now assuming the price of good one is two and the price of good th two is three, you have 12 units of income available. Find the consumer's optimal selection using the demand functions you've already found. This is just plugging in the values, right? So 12 over two times two, 12 divided by four is three, or 12 over two times three is 12 divided by six is two. Then find the, cons find the optimal selection of good one if the price of good two quadruples. Uh, just look at your demands, right? The price of good, price of good two triple or quadruples and demand for good one doesn't have anything to do with the price of good two, right? So my demand for good one, x1 star, is invariant to changes in the price of good two. So my demand before and after, any price change for good two remains three. Remember, this is kind of that cool property of Cop Douglas. All right, so that reaches the end of the walkthrough for this solution video. There is a sketch of the solution that I've already posted on, uh, on Canvas, and um, so I'm gonna go ahead and could go ahead and conclude here. Um, anyway, have a good night, everyone.